Fast falls the even time The darkness deepens Lord, with me abide Another helpers Fail and comfort me Help of the helpers Abide Tempter's power, who like thyself, my guidance they can be through cloud and sunshine. Welcome to worship today. My name is Dory Newcomer. I'm the pastor here at the Lima United Methodist Church, and we are working our way through the New Testament this year. Right now, we're in the book of 1 Corinthians, and our key verse comes to us from 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31. Paul wrote, Now eagerly desire the greatest gifts, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. And then, of course, in 1 Corinthians 13, he goes on to talk about the most excellent way, which is love. So today we're going to be talking about love and how the Spirit of God is at work in us and how we are called to make a form holy friendships, friendships that are focused not on getting for ourselves, but on giving to others. Now eagerly desire the greatest gifts, not for our own sake, but for the world's sake. And yet I will show you the most excellent way, the way of love. I hope that you will really be blessed by this worship service today, that you'll feel God's presence close with you and be empowered to go out and serve God in the world. Amen. Hello, my name is Clara and thank you for welcoming us in the comfort of your homes, your offices or wherever you are watching us from. Please join me in the call to worship. O oh Lord our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Your voice causes the sea to roar and the wind to howl. You have set your glory above the heavens. The moon and the stars sing your praises. What are human beings that you are mindful of us? Who are we that you care for us? Yet you have made us a little lower than God. You have crowned us with the glory and honor. O oh Lord, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Please join me in the opening prayer. Holy wisdom, spirit of truth, 
we behold your glory in the starry heavens and your wonder in the earth and sea. We are in awe that you care for us so deeply. We marvel that you have called us to become one with you, to be members of the body of Christ. Steep us in your wisdom, O oh Lord, and lead us into lives overflowing with your goodness that we might glorify you in all that we say and do. Amen. The July memory voice is from Galatians 6, verse 9. So, let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. scripture lesson is coming from 1 Corinthians 12 27 through to 13 up to 13 now we are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it and God has placed in the church first of all apostles second prophets, third, teachers, and then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, 
are all teachers? Do all miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. And yet I will show you the most excellent way. 13. If I speak in tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have a gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is most proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we profess in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in the mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three main, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these all is love. How many sermons have you heard on Paul's famous treatise on love? Earlier this month, I officiated at a wedding and the couple chose 1 Corinthians 13 for the scripture reading. And honestly, you cannot go wrong with this passage. I know that I personally can always use a reminder that love is patient because even though I want to be loving, I am not always patient. This passage is so familiar, but it gives us reminders, right? That love is kind, love keeps no records of wrong, love is not self-seeking. Boy, does this fly counter to the ways of our world today. I have used this passage frequently at weddings over the years because it captures how couples feel as they stand together on their wedding day, pledging to live differently as they vow to live lovingly forever, being there in those moments is one of the best things about my job. But Paul did not write this scripture with weddings in mind. He wasn't writing to give husbands and wives a template for happy marriage. He was writing about love to help all of us in the church use our spiritual gifts in ways that make the most positive contribution. Paul points out that it doesn't matter what your gifts are if you don't use them lovingly. You could be the best preacher in the world, but without love, your words are as effective as a clanging gong or a noisy bell. You could be the smartest person around and able to, to explain all kinds of mysteries, 
But without love, what good does that do anybody? Even if you give all you have to the poor, if you do not love, all that giving amounts to nothing. Faith is good, hope is good, but love is the best. Paul wrote his famous treatise on love just after having written quite a bit about spiritual gifts. And one thing that surprised me when I was reading through 1 Corinthians this summer is how Paul says to eagerly desire the greater gifts. It's as if Paul is saying we have some control over how gifted we are by the Spirit. Earlier in 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote, Now to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. We might assume that um, means that God and God alone picks out the ways the Spirit is manifested in each believer. But now Paul seems to be indicating that we have some say in the matter. Eagerly desire the greater gifts, he says, which must mean if we want more and greater manifestations of the Spirit, we can get them. But it would be good to ask ourselves why. Why would Paul want us to seek more of God's Spirit? Obviously, since we're all part of one body, we're not to eagerly desire the greater gifts so we can make our particular part look good. There's no individual credit for being the smartest person in the room or the most gifted person in the church. This is not about puffing ourselves up or maximizing our individual contribution. This is about synergy, about doing the best we can to bring out the best in everyone. We are to eagerly desire the greater gifts so that we can help bring out the best and greatest in everyone so the body of Christ can make its greatest contribution to the kingdom of God. Love is the most excellent way of using our gifts, whatever they are. Using our gifts to build others up, help others shine, and create opportunities for everyone to connect to their giftedness and have the joy of being part of God's work in the world. Regardless of what our gifts are, we are to deploy them in a loving way that seeks others' well-being as equal to our own. But Paul doesn't just say to use the gifts we have lovingly. He says to eagerly desire the greater gifts. And I wonder what he means by that. Can we just go through the Bible and look at the various lists of spiritual gifts and pick out the ones we want as if we were um, making a wish list from Amazon or thinking old school, if we were looking through the Christmas toy catalog and making a list? I remember talking about this one time with some clergy colleagues and one of my pastor friends said, you know, if I thought my congregation were lacking a particular gift, I would just ask God to give it to me. <laughs> On the one hand, that makes sense, right? Jesus tells us to ask for everything we need. But it struck me as a rather arrogant thing to say. Because the goal isn't for any one person to become supremely gifted. The goal is to bring about the greatest good, which often comes from empowering others to live into their gifts. I have a saying on my bulletin board in my office here at the church, don't overpower, empower. Just as the Spirit gifts all of us, the Spirit leads us to help others discover and employ their gifts. It all comes down to love, doesn't it? If we're focused on loving God with our whole beings, then I think it's true. We have some say in the gifts we receive, but not in the way we might think at first. Paul tells us that the manifestations of the Spirit are for the common good. But in my experience, they also come as a result of the common good. In other words, I think it's rare to see one supremely gifted person surrounded by a bunch of lukewarm Christians. In general, I think we receive more gifts when as a community, we are working together to desire them. Recently, I watched an interview of Ed Catmull, one of the founders of Pixar, the people who make animated movies like Inside Out and Toy Story and Finding Nemo. He talked about how hard it is to do performance evaluations of their creative employees, especially if the project they're working on isn't going well. 
Just because the movie isn't a success doesn't mean that the individuals working on it did not do a great job. So Ed Catmull went on to say something very interesting. He said that when the work is not going well, when it's not a commercial success, the way the work is done becomes the criteria for evaluating the work. Even if the project turns out to be a creative flop, which they accept as inevitable, given that no artist's work is commercially successful every time, even if the, in terms of dollars, the project was a disaster, if people can find ways to work together well, Pixar considers the project a success because they know that the quality of the collaboration determines the quality of the creativity over the long haul. The quality of the collaboration determines the quality of the creativity over the long haul. This strikes me as an extremely important insight. Perhaps that is why Paul, before going on to specify which gift he thinks the church members in Corinth should focus on, he talks to them about love. Because no matter what their work is, no matter if they're engaged in healing or preaching or hospitality, if they can do that with love, in the end, all that work will lead to creativity, to new life, to new people changed by the good news of God's love. The more we can show love to each other, the more we will be blessed by new manifestations of God's spirit. Recently, I started reading a book called Holy Friendship, Nurturing Relationships That Stain, Sustain Pastors and Leaders by Victoria Atkinson White. See, she teaches at Duke Divinity School, and she's concluded that without deep friendships, most pastors and lay leaders will not be effective over the long haul. And she calls these special friendships holy friendships. And she says without them, we cannot do the holy work we're called to do. We were built to live in community. Discipleship is truly a group project. And none of us can be the body of Christ alone. We need each other, but we need each other in particular ways. We need people who will be patient with us. We need people who will help, see the, help us see the truth about ourselves. People who will call us out when we're heading down the wrong path and bear with us when we're going through hard times. In other words, we don't just need fair weather friends. We need holy friends, God-like friends. Victoria Atkinson White says, holy friends participate in our lives in a triune way. They root us in God's ongoing story by valuing our past, holding space for our present, and helping us midwife a vision for the future. I love this idea that holy friends root us in God's ongoing story. They help us see that God was with us back then, they help us see and give space to discover that God is with us right now. And they help us midwife a vision for the future. This kind of deep connection is the birthplace of creativity and joy. Now to each one of us is given a manifestation of the spirit for the common good. Paul also said, eagerly desire the greatest gifts. And then he said, and now I will show you the most excellent way. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians gives us the framework for life in the church. And like at a wedding when two people stand together before God and their friends and their family and vow to love differently, to love exclusively, to love better than the rest of the world. We in the church are called to stand together before God and pledge to love well. We may not know exactly where we're going, but we know the way to get there, and that way is love. But sometimes, don't you get tired of hearing about love in the church? <laughs> I remember many years ago, before I became a pastor, 
Phil and I were members at the Lansdale at United Methodist Church and our pastor Dave Cramp was preaching one time about love and I thought to myself, blah, blah, blah. We don't need more love, we need more action. Let's do more now. As I early, said earlier, patience has never been one of my strengths. At the Lansdale Church, they used to hang a banner in the sanctuary for Lent and it had a picture of a chalice of red wine with droplets of blood falling from it. And it said, love gave at the top near the chalice. And it said, love gave at the middle near the first droplet. And then it said, love gave at the bottom. I used to sit there and worship and wonder about that banner. Now I think I'm finally starting to understand it. Love gave, love gives. It is not self-seeking. It always gives for others. It gives protection, it gives grace, it gives hope. It gives and gives and gives over the long haul because love will never end. We should eagerly seek the greatest gifts. I agree with Paul 100% on that. But let's not forget to ask why. Why do we want more spiritual gifts? Do we want to be able to manifest God's power in greater ways so that we can help the world change? <laughs> or do we want more spiritual gifts just to have them? In which case we know we're going to be like noisy gongs and clanging bells. If we want more just to accumulate for ourselves, even if we amass a faith that can move mountains, if we're doing that for ourselves as opposed to being able to give away more to others, Paul says we are nothing. Our focus should never be on getting more, getting more people, getting more dollars, getting more influence. Our focus should be on giving more, giving away hope, the hope that there is a God who cares, giving away encouragement that there are people that can help make God real to you, giving away forgiveness and peace and joy, giving of ourselves until there is truly justice for all. I think that is the key difference between regular friendship and holy friendship. Regular friendship is mostly about what you get out of a relationship. You get happy experiences, you get companionship, you get novelty. But holy friendship is more about what we give. We give of ourselves so someone else can become whole. And in the process, they give of themselves and it helps us become whole. The love is in the giving. Our primary job and our primary goal is to give away what we have, to give away hope, peace, joy, and love, to give away the good news that God loves us and wants to be friends with us forever, to give away the manifestations of God's power in whatever ways God wants that to be manifest. If we can learn to collaborate with God in this way as giver awayers of God's goodness, instead of as people focused on getting results for ourselves. Well, I believe it is the quality of, the, of our collaboration with God and with each other that will lead to creativity and growth over the long haul. Now to each one is given a manifestation of the spirit for the common good. Paul went on to say, eagerly desire the greatest gifts. And then he wrote, and now I will show you the most excellent way. Who might God be nudging you to reach out to, to cultivate a holy friendship with? How can we nurture holy friendships within our congregation and our circle of acquaintances? Who will help us midwife God's vision for our future? I hope you'll take some time this week to invest in a friend. It is a truly holy endeavor. Amen.
Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptations, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For our benediction this morning, I'd just like to read a few verses from 1 Corinthians 13, Paul's su summary of what he knows about love and how we're to use our spiritual gifts in a loving way. He says, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know up in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know, know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Go in peace and serve your Lord. Amen. There's only love.